Hello and welcome everybody to the beginning of a new month and the start of a new sermon series. This month we're going to be focusing on mission and I'm very excited to say that each week we will have a special visitor, a partner in mission with us that we'll be speaking with and hearing about. Today I'm very excited that Spiro has joined us from Compassion. And I hope you're encouraged to hear some of the incredible work that Compassion is doing as through the power of the Holy Spirit and in partnership with Christians throughout the world, making a difference in the lives of young children, in the lives of families and in the lives of their communities. Of course, at the heart of Christian mission is the message of the gospel, the good news about Jesus. And so, in conjunction with our uh, month of mission, we'll be looking at various aspects of the gospel. And today, we're going to be focusing on the urgency of the gospel. So please join me in prayer as we dig into uh, this part of Matthew's gospel together. Father God, may the words of my mouth, the thoughts of our minds, and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing in your sight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The very first words of Jesus that Matthew records for us as Jesus begins his ministry around Lake Galilee, following uh, his time of temptation in the desert, can be found in Matthew chapter 4. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. From the very beginning of Jesus' ministry, there is an urgency about the message that is being proclaimed. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. It's the same message that John the Baptist had been preaching in the desert prior to Jesus' baptism. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. The kingdom of heaven is near, meaning the time has now come for God to establish his rightful rule over his creation, both in judgment and in salvation. And the only appropriate response for people is to repent, to turn back to God. Repentance is more than just a change of mind or feeling sorry for one's sins. Repentance is a radical and deliberate turning or returning to God that results in a change in the way, in the way a person lives. The time for God's promised Messiah King had arrived. But the problem was, Israel was not ready for God. Israel's leaders, their kings and their priests had failed to take care of the people like a shepherd would take care of their sheep. They hadn't looked after the weak, they hadn't healed the sick or bound up the injured. They hadn't brought back the strays or searched for the lost. They ruled them harshly and as a result, the nation was in tatters. The people were suffering from all kinds of sicknesses and diseases. They were controlled by evil spirits. They were lost and vulnerable. They needed someone to take care of them. And when Jesus saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. The prophet Ezekiel records for us in Ezekiel 34 that God himself will come to Israel's rescue I myself, says the Lord, will search for my sheep and look after them. Now here in the pages of Matthew's Gospel, we see Jesus doing precisely that. Going from one town to the next, calling people to turn back to God, healing their sicknesses and taking care of them. Jesus is the true shepherd of God to the people, calling them back to their father, and taking care of their every need. But there isn't much time left. Jesus says to his disciples in uh, verse 37 there, chapter 9, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. In the Old Testament, the word harvest was used by the prophets to describe the coming judgment. Harvesting is the process of gathering a ripe crop in the field. It's the most labour-intensive activity of the whole growing season. It requires lots of workers to sort the wheat from the chaff. 
Jesus is comparing the people of Israel to a harvest. Lots of workers are needed to go out amongst the crowds and call people to turn back to God. John the Baptist had been doing some of that work until he'd been put in prison. And of course, he's about to be killed by Herod. Jesus says to his disciples, verse 38 there, Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Well, no sooner had Jesus uh, instructed the disciples to ask the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into the harvest field, then Jesus calls them to him. Uh, chapter 10, verse 1. Jesus called his 12 disciples to him and gave them authority to drive out evil spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. Those whom Jesus asked to pray for workers, he now calls to become workers. The word call here means summons. Jesus summons his disciples. He summons them to himself. He has something very important that he is about to tell them and give them. He tells them that they are to go out and proclaim that the kingdom of God is near. And he gives them the authority to do the work that he has been doing. To heal the sick, to bind up the injured, to search for the lost, to preach to the people of Israel that the kingdom of heaven is near. The disciples didn't choose to get that authority. Jesus gave it to them freely. The work that Jesus had begun, the disciples are now being called to continue under the direct authority of Jesus. It's a rescue mission of the highest order. But the disciples are sent out with some rather unusual instructions. Verse 5, chapter 10. Do not go among the Gentiles or enter any town of the Samaritans. Go rather to the lost sheep of Israel. What are we to make of this? It can't be that Jesus doesn't care about the Gentiles. Jesus regularly teaches about the importance of loving your enemies and praying for those who persecute you. It's not in keeping with Jesus' character to not care for people. It must therefore be some in the timing. The time for the gospel to go out to the whole world will come. But not yet. Not until after Jesus' death and resurrection will the gospel formally go out to the Gentile nations. And Jesus will also appoint another apostle to help take that gospel message to the Gentiles. But not yet. The mission set out here at this point in time is limited to Israel. The priority at this point is to call Israel to repentance. Now the method for carrying out the mission was to trust Jesus for everything. The disciples were to travel light. Do not take along any gold or silver or copper in your belts. Take no bag for the journey or extra tunic or sandals or a staff, for the worker is worth his keep. And we see here in verses 9 and 10, they weren't to take any money, no food, no extra clothing with them. The disciples were to trust the Lord even for the essentials of life. And they were to share the gospel with everyone who would listen. They were really being called to live on the edge. It was a call to put the first things first. The gospel should be taken first uh, to those who are most receptive. Uh, verse 11. Whatever town or village you enter, search for some worthy person and stay at his house until you leave. Now, by worthy here, we don't mean uh, that uh, in some way these people are earning their, their salvation. Uh, the, the idea here is that of free hospitality. It it's, seems foreign to us here in the West, but not so in the East. In accordance with Eastern tradition, a guest had unquestioned rights to provision and protection, to food, to lodging and to safety. In other words, the disciples were being instructed not specifically to go and stay with what we would call Christians today, 
but rather someone who was willing to welcome them into their home and be willing to listen to the message that they were proclaiming. The final thing that Jesus says to the disciples in this section is an instruction on how to deal with people who reject the message. Verses 14 and 15. If anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, shake the dust off your feet when you leave that home or town. I tell you the truth, it will be more bearable for Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than for that town. Jesus knows that his message will not be accepted by everyone who hears it. But the rejection is not to be glossed over. Rather, it is to be emphasized by the shaking of dust off the feet. These people have had the benefit of a clear call to repentance, but come the day of judgment, God will hold them accountable for not listening to the call to repent. Well, what are we uh, to make of this for our own lives? From Matthew chapter 10, we can't immediately say that we are called to do what the disciples did. At that moment in history, Jesus hadn't yet gone to the cross. He hadn't yet risen from the dead. He hadn't yet ascended into glory. The disciples were given a specific authority by Jesus to go only to the people of Israel. For Israel at that time, the message from Matthew 10 is very clear. Repent for the kingdom of God is near. Turn back to God while there is still time because God's promised Messiah King is about to bring judgment on the world. Of course, after Jesus' death, resurrection and ascension, the disciples' authority broadens significantly. In fact, Jesus, just before he ascends, says to them in uh, Matthew 28, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always, to the very end of the age. For us today, we are people who live post Jesus' death, resurrection, and ascension. Therefore, anyone today who is a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ is one of his disciples, and therefore has been given authority to proclaim the message of the gospel. We have God's Holy Spirit living within us. Each of us who has given our life to the Lord has a story to tell about how Jesus has become the Lord of our life, what he has done in our life. So can I encourage you to tell that story? Tell your story about what Jesus has done in your life. Tell it to anyone who will listen. We have a clear mandate from Jesus, the very authority of God himself. What we have freely been given, we should not hold on to. We must freely give it away. What good will it be for us on that final day if... Uh, We have failed to explain to our brother or sister or our our family member, our neighbour, what Jesus has done for us. The good news about Jesus. If we are followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, then we have a gospel to proclaim. We have a story to tell. And we have been given the authority to proclaim it. The second thing for us to note from uh, this passage today, the message is urgent. When John the Baptist was preaching repentance in the desert of Judea, for the kingdom of heaven is near, the situation was serious. John was not mucking around. It was a serious call to the people of Israel to wake up and turn back to God while there was still time. When Jesus began to preach, there was a similar urgency, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. And when Jesus empowered the disciples and sent them out, there was also an urgency to their message. Go to the towns and villages, preaching the message that the kingdom of heaven is near. That urgency is still here today. The kingdom has come. Jesus has died and has risen. 
and one day he will return. People need to hear the message of the gospel and respond to it. They need to be introduced to Jesus. They need to know the the urgency and the importance of turning to Jesus in repentance and faith. They need to know that the only way to avoid the coming wrath of God's judgment on their sin is through trusting in Jesus. The message is urgent. The third thing uh, for us to note today from this passage is that more workers are needed. Jesus said the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into the harvest field. We need more people to get the message of the gospel out to the world. Look at our government. Whatever side of uh, politics you may stand on, they are using every means possible to fight against the coronavirus. Every day, on every form of media, they broadcast the same message. Stay at home. Get tested if you have symptoms. Get vaccinated. They are pulling out all stops to fight against the virus. And this is a one in a hundred year pandemic. Spiritually, we are fighting a battle against an enemy that has implications into eternity. Sin left unchecked will cause us to come under the judgment of God's wrath. We have been given a message that impacts people's lives throughout all of eternity. We need everyone on board. There are so many people in this world who don't know Jesus as their Lord and Saviour. We need to keep praying to God, asking him to send out more workers into his harvest field to tell people the message of the gospel. At least for the next four weeks, we're all in lockdown. Uh, Things may change after that. We hope they will. But at least for the next four weeks, who can you tell your story to while you're in lockdown? Ask God to open up an opportunity for you. Pray to God. Ask him for an opportunity to tell someone your story about what Jesus has done for you in your life. The last thing that I want to say is to those who are listening, but may not have yet responded to Jesus as their Lord and Savior. I want to say, don't be one of the people that Jesus warns the disciples about who rejects the good news. Jesus calls everyone to turn from their sins and put their trust in him. Heed the warning. Sodom and Gomorrah were obliterated for ignoring God's warning. Don't be one of those people who rejects the good news of the gospel. Please join me in prayer. Loving Heavenly Father, Thank you for your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave his life so we could live. Thank you for the disciples and their obedience in continuing the work of the Lord Jesus, preaching the good news about your kingdom and caring for those in need. Please take us, Father, and use us in the work of proclaiming the good news about Jesus today. And we pray that you would continue to raise up more workers for the harvest. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.